Hey, it's Mazzy, and welcome back. Today, I'm recording this in the main library uh, of Maslow's World Headquarters up in Seattle. Uh, this is the Beetle Library. Now, back here are about maybe half, maybe a little more than half of my Beetle collection. Why have the Beatles been written about? Maybe more than anyone else. I can't think of any other uh, celebrity, famous person, historian, politician uh, written about more than the Beatles. And I've been all in, my guess is I have 95 to 98% of all the Beatle books. 90% of the time in the introduction, uh, each author tends to write why this book is necessary, why their book is different than every other book. But going back to 1982, David Bacon and I wrote The Beatles England. And at the time was the first travel guide. You went to England, uh, you went to Liverpool, you went to London, you went to Hamburg. And if you asked, where are all the Beatles sites? Oh, there's nothing here to see, even at the Liverpool Town Council. Of course, if you've been to Liverpool in the last 20 years, you know uh, the difference that it's all about the Beatles. It's all about tourism. Kind of uh, feel honored that it uh, took uh, two guys from San Francisco to do the first sort of travel log, visual travel log. First, I'm going to show a, a book by Bruce Spizer. Bruce Spizer is probably possibly written more Beatle books than almost anyone. Um, he did a, a, an amazing series that go back, you know, 20 some years, maybe actually more than that, 30 years, on uh, the various labels and record company labels from VJ to Capital to um, you know, Apple Records and uh, to, and UK presses and really getting down in, in the nitty gritty of it. They're, they're amazing series of books. Uh, this is the latest one. The Beatles, Please Please Me, to With the Beatles. These are uh, nice, beautiful square editions. Uh, these go through uh, Please Please Me, With the Beatles, Introducing the Beatles and Meet the Beatles. You get the UK and uh, US releases. He goes in a lot of wonderful visuals of what was happening in pop culture at the time, from movies, from, in this case, James Bond, that really literally led to the movie Help, uh, to the picture sleeves in America, and in the UK EPs and what was happening at the time of these releases. So it's it's an historic view. There has been a series of these books coming out over the last several years, kind of anniversary editions, pretty much 50th and 60th year anniversaries. So you got a uh, rubber soul and revolver with yesterday and today, of course, in the butcher cover, you got Sergeant Pepper as a 50th, you got the Beatles album series, Magical mystery tour uh, with yellow submarine there this is like a slipcase volume most of these are signed i've collect them you've got the beatles white album and the launch of apple records and abbey road and of course let it be get back etc a book that i really really enjoyed that came out and this is uh, act naturally the beatles on film by steve mateo and this is the book david and i almost wrote and uh, Steve has no idea what I'm talking about. After we did The Beatles England, once you start doing a book, you get the taste of it. Now, we did our book before the internet existed. We started this book in 1980, uh, The Beatles England, and went, obviously, and had to research, send letters out, write to people, wait months, literally, for them to write back, have a, a couple of trips to the UK and Hamburg, obviously, to London, Liverpool, the countryside, West Malling Airfield, to look at these locations and photograph them. And then do our own licensing, visiting New York photo agencies and in London, and uh, licensing images for our book. We did it all ourselves in those days, pre-internet. Not a bragging, just a fact. But after we did that, we were thinking of what else to do. And the book we wanted to do, and we had a title for it, and we started kind of loosely doing it. So it's not this book, and uh, he did it beautifully, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Our book was going to be called Images of Broken Light, The Beatles on Film. And our vision was a very pictorial book, not as scholarly as this and uh, detailed as this per film. He gets into the, what the, you know, Help, Hard Day's Night, Magic Mystery Tour, Let It Be. Um, and he gets into the all the cinema of how a Hard Day's Night came to be with the Maisley Brothers doing the Washington, D.C. train ride in that concert film. It's a scholarly tome, but it gets into uh, details on the production of the films where they're recorded, uh, different scenes and how these films were made. 
uh, our idea at the time was going to be more visual, taking everything from uh, the the um, Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, the paperback writer, Rain, the videos, uh, the solo films, uh, reviews at the time, contemporary uh, reviews from Time Magazine and The New Yorker and other, uh, you know, British magazines as well, movie posters and have it more of a, of, of, in a way like uh, we were thinking of these big cinema books, and but really wanted to showcase how important uh, the Beatles were to cinema. It never happened. Uh, there's been several different books on uh, specific films. I have books on Hard Day's Night. I have books on photography, on help. I have a lot of the books that he researched to get here, but uh, Steve Matteo did a lot of interviews and scholarly research search, uh, to prepare this book. They get into, you know, he does talk about the other sort of projects that were happening of Paul McCartney uh, scoring the family way. Uh, it's scattered with some photographs of the time and of the period and of the, of the movies, uh, production photographs, talks about uh, the, literally the day-to-day -day productions in some cases. Now, not every single day, but when the Beatles go to uh, Bahama, when they uh, work at Twickenham Studios, uh, when they go up and work on uh, what some would call the failed uh, Magical Mystery Tour led by McCartney. In this case, he gets into talking about Richard Lester and uh, the films that Richard Lester was doing, working with The Goon Show. And uh, just, this is really a great great overview of the Beatles and cinema and a great deep dive. Probably, I can't think of another book that has the detail of this in those films. Obviously, as I said, books on specific films have touched in that and biographies, but this gets really in there. So this is from Backbeat Books and it's uh, just came out several months ago. So highly recommended if you're into the Beatles, obviously, and if you're into cinema. Now this one, you know, it, it's amazing how, um, Few books there are on Ringo Starr, the only Beatle that I ever met. And uh, as I kind of do the introduction, I'm going to scan my my meager uh, section on biographies and books on Ringo. Uh, this is called Drumming in His Madness, the Ringo Starr discography by Andrew James. In the introduction, he also uh, says, another Beatle book? The world needs another Beatle book? I think, I think Andrew says that. One of these books, or all of them say that. But um, he also thanks his wife for listening to him play Ringo Starr uh, records like day in, day out for uh, as long as it took to research and to write this book. And I tell you, if you have a wife that allows you to play Ringo Starr for uh, a year or two or three, you need to hold on to that wife. And I'm a big Ringo fan. Now, as I read this, what's good about this book, it goes through every song. He rates every song. Uh, the solo years. When you do a book like this and you rate it, it's so subjective. But he talks about how this is an introduction for uh, new fans, people getting into it. And I think, as I recall, he says he's in his 40s as he as this book is published, mid-40s. So I got about 20 years on him. Not that I know anymore. Believe me, it's not that. But there is a different experience getting into this music uh, when the Beatles and these solo records came out of course in this case Ringo Starr I bought every single and I continue to buy every single Ringo release as it's released some I like better than others but I've always been and sometimes I had to defend myself at times when I'd been critical of Ringo's records or McCartney's records or Her any of the Beatles you know some people there's a little bit of this um this Beatle fandom that's, oh, come on, how can you diss the Beatles? How can you diss that record? You shouldn't be all in on these records. If you love them, great. And if you don't, that's fine too. And I like a lot of Ringo's records. I think we disagree on some of the orders here. Um, he does talk, uh, I think he gives it a bad rating. There's a there's a cover song he does, Sneaking Sally Through the Alley on, is that Ringo the Fourth? I forgot what album that is. But I adore that song and to me, uh, you know, the great version of that is Robert Palmer's album. So after Robert Palmer does it with that soulful voice, that great little feet in the meters backing him up, when you, Ringo is like fails by comparison. He loves Vertical Man, which is a later, we all, we say later now, that's pretty mid-period Ringo. You know, I remember uh, Bad Boy. Uh, David and I would mock Bad Boy, that album. Bad Boy, yo, yo, yo. Same with Ringo the Fourth. I just couldn't stand those records. Uh, for a while, but I, then I remember getting into um, um, Rack My Brain and uh, 
Stop and Smell the Roses, which I like. And actually, that's where Drumming in His Madness comes in. Terrible song. <laughs> so you name your book after that. But this is a really great deep dive. If you're into um, Ringo, you know, the Mark Hudson years who produced some great stuff with, uh, which I love that album, with, with uh, some of the members of Jellyfish doing the harmonies. And that is a wonderful, that was kind of a return. Uh, obviously, the Joe Walsh record uh, that was originally only put out in Canada. He couldn't even, a Beatle couldn't even get a record put out uh, in America. But he literally goes through every track on the CD or the album. Uh, and for instance, Way to the World, it's a score of nine out of 10. I like it. I do like that song. I would agree with that. Vertical Man, seven out of 20. Hmm. So Drumming is My Madness, a book uh, by. Andrew James, the Ringo Starr discography, 2023. This just came out in the last few weeks. And again, highly recommended if you're into the Ringo uh, disc period. <laughs> this records is music. The next book is the newest book. Uh, and this is a book, frankly, I haven't read completely through it. Literally just arrived in the last day or so. Uh, Fashioning the Beatles by Deirdre Kelly. The looks that shook the world. Of course, we know about Beatle music. We know about uh, Beatle history with the, po the political side of the Beatles, John Lennon, uh, where they came from. There's so many different uh, books and different topics and s sometimes very small segments. And I can't think of a book exactly like this. And this is really uh, looking at their fashion, their style. We all know, especially when we look back at them. First of all, in the very beginning with those uh, suits, with those velvet collar suits, uh, looking back even prior to that in the Cavern Club when they were in the leather. We didn't see that initially when they hit America on Ed Sullivan. That was new to us until we saw early photographs. Most of us Americans didn't know the leather, the leather side of the Beatles. And of course, Swing in London from 66 to 67 into 68. Uh, just their style, how Swing in London was big with Mary Quant, with uh, Twiggy, just all of a sudden, you know, the pop of color that came out of that dim, gray, dark city of London. And fashion and music, uh, to me, coincides. And it's great that there's a book like this. Again, not having read it, my only uh, disappointment, if it's a disappointment, most people probably wouldn't even notice this, is that a book like this that is so about the fashion and so about style... I wish it was designed differently. I wish they do include color photographs. And again, I'm going to flip through uh, some of the book while we're talking here. Just a brief uh, overview. The book is jam-packed with photographs. A lot of images from the entire career of the Beatles. The various uh, clothing from the leather times to the collarless jackets and suits uh, to a more free form. And when they physically grew hair even longer and facial hair and the psychedelic Sergeant Pepper and of course the Mad Day Out uh, photo shoot that happened in 1968 and beyond. The Beatles were style mavens again. And I wish this book emulated that. I wish it was designed in a really kind of fun design where the photographs were really part of the articles and the writing intertwined a little more. There's certain books that I have in my collection that to me are just amazing design. Now I know sometimes it takes more budget in the layout and how it's done and maybe sometimes different formats, uh, physical formats of books. And I know that isn't always possible in a book. If you're doing a design book on fashion design, I think uh, I would like personally to see it more uh, of, a, of, of a design as important as a copy in this book. But this already looks like a really interesting read. So I'm gonna sort of uh, tentatively recommend it before I've read it all. And that is Fashioning the Beatles, The Look That Shook the World by Deirdre Kelly. If you're a McCartney fan or a Beatle fan, it's, it's an important book. And this is the McCartney Legacy uh, Volume 1. This came out about six months ago. It took me a while to get through this. Not that it's a difficult book, but there's so much here. And I tend to this type of book, uh, don't read it from start to finish in one sitting. Not that it's, you know, they say with a great mystery, you can't put it down. It's not that. And that's not taking away from uh, the, the great, you know, what is in this book, the content, the way it's... Uh, curated and well-written. This is by Alan Cozen 
an Adrian Sinclair. What's, what's great about this, I think this originally started out more as one of those detailed books of song by song and record by record. The solo years from 69, I think it goes through, it goes through, yeah, Band on the Run, end of 1973. And it really gets in detail about the recording when McCartney was going through uh, the personal uh, trauma of the Beatles breakup, um, the lawsuits with Apple, and, and, and the reality of what that was about, and uh, obviously the, the starting and the beginning of Wings. And I'm going to say this, and I've said it many times on my channel, I think um, one of the greatest albums Paul ever put out is Wings Wildlife, and I will stand by that for the rest of my life. I think it's one of the few McCartney albums of this period. Maybe McCartney won the first McCartney solo that holds up in terms of doesn't sound dated. And of course, the story of at the end of that year, the band, uh, you know, quitting before he went to Lagos and Band on the Run, which became this monster hit. I like Band on the Run. There are several songs to me that don't hold up after 50 years now. Uh, what are we, 50 years this year, right? But they go into so much detail on the recordings and uh, maybe the emotional support that Linda gave to Paul McCartney up in Scotland. And when these records were recorded, all the the stuff that went into uh, McCartney and, and and Ram. Ram, I think, is another record that holds up. And I think it's been reevaluated uh, better than others. Uh, this gets into a lot of details, talks about the recording sessions. Uh, who was on what song, where the songs were recorded. A recording session, Saturday, January 24th, 1970. EMI Studio, Studio 2, mixing of the lovely Linda. There will be something, Valentine's Day, Mama Uyu, and Teddy Boy. <clears throat> so, so even though a lot of stuff was recorded up on the farm in Scotland, a lot of the work in a lot of posts, a lot of the mixing was done at Abbey Road you know, back at Abbey Road. Sometimes this book is like a diary. It, it digs in day to day on certain things of certain things leading up to a recording where Paul was, where Paul and Linda were, uh, where they went to work on this, who they met with, obviously in the legal side of things and to the recording side of things. It's not just a, a, a book on the music and the records. It's about the time. It's as scholarly uh, pretty much as anything Mark Lewison uh, has done. Uh, his, this is supposedly the first of at least three volumes, uh, maybe more. I love the minimalist design. I think this is one of the coolest covers uh, right now. And I'm maybe superficial, but I think book design and book covers are really important in this. And uh, they really succeeded, their publisher. Uh, this is done by Deitzt. Look at that end paper, strawberries. Now, shouldn't that be for strawberry fields? So the McCartney legacy is actually more of a biography than I thought it would be. When I heard they were working on this uh, for several years before it came out, I really thought it was going to be more of uh, a database plus of the songs and the recording. Uh, in a way, also like Mark Lewison has done with the Beatles catalog and the detailed things he'd done. But he, they really get into the stories here and the details of the events that led up to these records being made in the music. And again, the personal trauma, the personal angst McCarty was going through after, after splitting up the Beatles, one of the elements that split up the Beatles and how it turned out and, you know, if it would ever turn out and what Wings was about, how important a uh, Wings was for Paul. Uh, this really takes a great look at um, literally the McCartney legacy, the solo legacy of Paul McCartney. Fantastic book by Alan Cozen and Adrian Sinclair uh, out this year. Lastly, I want to thank a viewer. His name is Fred, Fred W. And he sent me this book, What I'd Say, The Atlantic Story, 50 Years. Now, I know why he sent this. First of all, I love books on the record business. I like uh, photo books. I like coffee table books like this. And of course, this is 25 years out of date. And I know why he sent it to me, because I just did a, a, a several videos on the 75th anniversary of Atlantic Records and uh, the reissues that are coming out, some audio files, some others that are coming out. 75 years of this great, great uh, record. Emmett Erdogan uh, put this book out, or he wrote it with, with Grail Marcus. You got Grail Marcus, Nat Hentoff, Lenny Kay, Robert Gordon, Robert Crisco, Vince Aletti, Will Friedworld, 
Dave Frick and Barney Hoskins, some, some great writers of rock and roll and jazz and soul music. Uh, there's Emmett Erdogan. Now, obviously, there's probably a 75th edition of this, but I've been looking through this over the last few years. I mean, you got John Coltrane, you got Ray Charles, you got Led Zeppelin, you got all these uh, recording artists that Atlantic put out. Uh, you got Aretha Franklin, you got, you know, the whole... A Woodstock thing. You got um, you got you got Dusty Springfield. You got Charles Mingus, Rosson, Roland Kirk. Now, how many artists play three reed instruments at once? I mean, you know, Roland Kirk, Rosson, Roland Kirk is the greatest. There's Yes. So he got into rock and roll and Prague and. You know, one of the big albums that they got into um, that became a big, huge hit with some R&B covers, actually, which was Proggy Symphonic, and that is Vanilla Fudge out of the East Coast. I and mean, that came out of nowhere with their version of You Keep Me Hanging On. But there's so many records. Crosby Stills, Nash & Young, Steve Stills. This go on and on. This is an amazing book. Robert Plant and Emmett Erdogan. I mean, I can go on and on with this book, but uh, I want to thank you, Fred, for this book. I love this kind of shit. This is cool stuff. So, 50 years of Atlantic Records. What about the next 25 years? Take care. Mazzy loves you.